All right, all right. Welcome to the Journey Church. If you're here in the building with us, why don't you stand to your feet and let's open up with one of our favorite Christmas songs. Sing, Angels We Have Heard. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains. And the mountains in reply echo back then. I take a deep breath and let's sing. Joria, he next shall cease day. Oh, Gloria, he next shall cease day. Sing about those old shepherds. Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why your joyous strains prolong? Say what may the tidings be which inspire your head. Glory! Here's the last one. Come to Bethlehem. Come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended me, Christ the Lord, the new Come on. Good morning. Welcome to the Journey Church. We're so glad you're here with us. Whether you are here on site with us in Springfield, Virginia, or you might be watching us someplace from the comfort of your home, we really appreciate you uh, tuning in with us today. So uh, raise your virtual or physical hand and tell me what Gloria in excelsis Deo means. Anybody? Anybody? Does anybody know? I know you know, Jim Pruitt. Glory to God in the highest one of the wonderful things about scripture and Christmas is that sometimes we end up singing worship songs every year without even kind of realizing it. It's a great thing about the holidays, and we want to switch it up just a little bit this morning and sing an old Christmas hymn today called, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. If you know it, you're welcome to sing along, but otherwise, just kick back and take it in. We're going to sing about welcoming the Lord into this world. Let's do it. Starting from the top, this is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Sounds like this. Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us. Let us find our rest in thee. His raw strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art. Dear desire of every nation, joy. Second verse coming at you. Born thy people to deliver. Born a child and yet a king. Born to reign in us forever. Thou thy gracious king.
sufficient merit raise us to thy glorious throne. Here comes something that might sound a little more familiar. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Let us adore. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Amen. Come, let us adore him. Just bow your heads wherever you are, and let's just pause for a moment of prayer. Father, those words, from our fears and sins, release us. Let us find our rest in thee. God, the holidays can be so stressful, especially with everything that has been going on in our country and in our world. So I pray for all of us that this Christmas, Christ miss season that you would do even more than you normally do to help us remember the reason for the season i'm sure santa claus was a great person but santa didn't die for me and my sin and my mess and my problems father would you teach us how to adore you here in the holiday season and every other season between we love you we appreciate you and we're just reaching for more of you today help us out lord we pray all these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. You guys can be seated. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Ah, welcome to Sunday morning service. We are so glad that we get to be together, whether you're home on the couch enjoying from your TV or here sitting in chairs enjoying us in person. We love to be together as a body and we love to have you here. And it's December. I don't know about you, but I am like way into the Christmas spirit already. I need it extra this year. Uh, there's a lot going on at the Journey for the holidays, so we really want you to stay informed and connected, and the best way to do that is the Journey app. So please download that, get that on your phone so you can know exactly what's going on. You can find out the Sunday program there, announcements, so much more, our connection card. If this is your first time here, or maybe you've been here before, but you haven't really gotten connected yet, please fill out that connection card. We want to know you and meet you. If you're here in person, uh, you can grab us in the tent outside, introduce yourself. We love new people. We're all about it. Speaking of Christmas time, you know here at The Journey, we are very into our community, helping our neighbors in need. And the big way we do that is in partnership with our local food bank, which is Koinonia. You may have noticed if you're here that there are Christmas trees in the back in the lobby and they've got ornaments on them. If you look closely, those ornaments have Christmas wishes on them. We are collecting donated toys to give to Koinonia for Christmas to help the families that they serve. The fun new thing this year is if you are at home online, we want you to participate too. We set up an Amazon gift registry of toys so you can still purchase a gift to donate and it will actually ship directly to Koinonia. So jump on that. We're very excited about ways we're changing it up and getting creative this year. Uh, you can find out all that information on the church website at the Love Nova tab. And speaking of Love Nova, I want to take a moment and just say thank you to everybody who has been donating to that fund over the past couple months. We have been able to give out hundreds of dollars in groceries and grocery gift cards. I have the best job because anytime I get a phone call where someone we love calls and is in need, nine out of ten times I get to instantly answer, yes, we can help with that. Uh, that's the best, and that is because of you guys and your generosity. So I just have to pause and say thank you. 
Uh, I got one more announcement. We have another prayer training coming up. Prayer is so important and so needed right now. Uh, there'll be another training on Saturday the 12th here at, um, in the building, but also live streamed. Uh, come, get a chance to learn about prayer, to practice prayer. Prayer is so important. If you want prayer this morning, uh, there's going to be prayer team members out in the lobby after service, and there's also prayer team members online. So all you have to do is click that live prayer button next to the chat. Do not hesitate to ask us for prayer. We want to talk. We want to pray and support you. That's it for announcements. I hope you've been enjoying our messy Christmas series. I know I have. Things feel very messy this year, uh, but it's good. I mean, I loved that sermon last week reminding us that there are so many messy people in the background of Jesus' story, of the Christmas story, and I love that God accepts us in our messiness. So let's get into it. Hey, Journey Church, welcome this morning. And uh, real quick, just to let you know, you're not seeing me on the screen because of a COVID scare again, okay? Um, I am and my family is on our tropical staycation here in Northern Virginia. And, uh, and so I am uh, coming to you this morning because I'm gonna introduce our, our speaker today. But, but before I get there, man, we're so glad that you're with us today, whether you are online or there in person in our building. Back in 1992, the Journey sent out a group of people to go plant a church in Chantilly. And uh, New Life Christian Church was created there in Chantilly and still exists today. Been around since, again, 1992. Well, they started planting campuses, and their third campus, I actually went to go lead and to begin back in 2006. Well, our family decided it was time for us to move on to go plant a church, and so in 2009, the fall of 2009, we hired Stan Rada to come on and to be our campus pastor so that we could, again, we could move on and go plant our church in North Carolina. Well, Stan and his lovely wife, Misty, who is an incredible photographer, by the way, have been leading that campus there in the Gainesville area since 2010 and just doing a great job with the people that are, are there. And so Stan has become a good friend of mine and um, he and his wife and our families uh, just, just love seeing each other and when we get to spend a little time together, which isn't often, uh, we just enjoy being together. Uh, but we're glad Stan is with us this morning. Uh, Stan loves motorcycles, uh, Stan loves discipleship, Stan loves Jesus. Uh, Stan really loves the, the Kansas City Chiefs, and I don't know what orders he would put all that in, but you can ask him if you'd like to do that. Um, but he's also an incredible communicator. And so I'm looking forward to this morning and hearing what Stan has to share with us as we continue our series called Messy Christmas. And Stan's going to talk about messy parents. So be ready for this today. But as he comes up on stage today, would you do me a favor? If you're there at home, if you're watching online, hit that heart button, show Stan some love. If you're there in the building, hey, show him some love too. Let's hear those hands clapping together as Stan comes and shares with us this morning. And I will see you again next week. Oh, thanks. Um, I wish he wouldn't have you clap before you've even heard me talk. You have no idea if you're actually going to enjoy this or not, but I mean, you've already clapped, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that for what it is. Um, yeah, so my name is Stan Rod. I do like motorcycles, Harley Davidson uh, for the win, and uh, I am a Chiefs fan, long-suffering for a long time until a young man by the name of Patrick Mahomes turned that around for us, and uh, now I enjoy winning, and so I'm good with that. Uh, hey, I want to introduce you guys to my family really quick here. Brought a picture along with me so you guys can get a feel for uh, my fam. Uh, so uh, the two tall ones there, uh, my oldest sons, um, my two boys there, Grant and Ashton. Uh, Grant's a senior in high school. Ashton's a sophomore a lacrosse player in high school. Uh, my little girl on my right 
over there. Uh, her name's Avery. She's in her last year of middle school. She is my pride and joy. You mess with her and I will find you and it will be ugly. Uh, so that's how it works with my daughter. The boys can fend for themselves. Um, and then in the middle is my wife, Misty. Uh, we've been married 20, a little over 20 years uh, now. And then um, my golden doodle Gwynny there somehow also finds her way into uh, family photos. I'm not really sure how that, how that happens exactly, but the dog, dog makes its way into family photos as well. Uh, so Chad asked me to come up and talk a little bit about messy parenting, so I figured why not start with a family photo, because uh, I was reminiscing on this uh, some time back, actually thinking back through uh, just parenting and situations and stories and things that have come up in my own life. And one of the first ones I remember from very early on, uh, my wife and I had our kids young, we got married young, we started young, and uh, I remember being in the hospital when my wife had our first son, Grant, and uh, the doctors handed me this baby boy, and uh, all the babies I had held to that point, I always gave back. You know, I, I always handed back to someone else who was responsible uh, to take care of that baby. And in this case, we were at the hospital for three or four days or whatever it was uh, after the kind of post-birth care stuff. And the hospital was like, no, you have to take the baby with you. And uh, I'm like, you guys do realize I have no idea what I'm doing, right? Like, I feel like a baby still myself. I think I was... 20, 21, like I was young when he was born. I'm like, I'm a kid myself. I don't know what I'm doing. Is there a manual? Like, do you guys have a book of instructions that come along with this? Because I don't know what I'm doing. And what was crazy was uh, how quickly my oldest son kind of became my buddy. Uh, my wife said I called him buddy so much she was going to think that was his name. That never did happen, but he was my buddy. Uh, and then my second son, Ashton, came along. He also became my little buddy. Uh, we, we hung out, play, all, do all the dad stuff right with the kids, throw them in the air, throw them across the room, land them on the bed, wrestle with them, all that kind of stuff. You know, all the dad stuff you do with your, with your kids. Uh, and then uh, my daughter was a bit of a surprise for us. We thought we were done at two. And uh, we have this little surprise baby uh, who showed up uh, some 13 years ago uh, and uh, kind of rounded out the family at that point. But parenting along the way over the course of the last 18, 19 years has been so messy. How many of you in the room are parents, uh, grandparents? How many of you have done the parenting journey thing? Anybody? Some of you, okay. Some of you aren't raising your hands, and I can tell you have kids. That means you're Baptists, and you're, you're a good Baptist for not raising your hand in church, but we're going to count you in. Uh, we're going to count you in the vote. Uh, but some of you, you know, you've done the parenting thing, and it's messy, right? Especially once you have more than one. Uh, so when I went from two to three, I talk a lot about going from man-to-man -man defense, going to zone defense when you're outnumbered. So you go from two to three, now it's zone defense. If you go from like three to four or five, you're just in prevent defense, praying for the best. You know, you're just hoping to survive the day kind of a thing once you end up with those kinds of numbers. But what's really messy about it is you do not get one kid who is the exact same as the other, right? Right. You have two kids and you have no idea how two so different people came from the same people. How did you guys end up so far apart? One of my kids um, trusts everything I say. I could just flat out lie right to their face. And they're like, yep, that's gospel truth. Whatever it is he just said, that's the truth. Like that's how one of my kids reacts. And then I've got one kid that reacts like, who are you? And why are you offering me advice? Oh, just because you have experience in life, you get to tell me what to, I don't think so. But like, I mean, they're just complete. How did two completely different people come from the same parents? And so parenting is messy because you don't know. You're always changing all the time and no kid is parented the same way twice. It's just constant craziness when it comes to parenting. Parenting has always been messy. This isn't new to us. This isn't new to American culture. It was messy all through human history, and it was really messy for a young couple some 2,000 years ago, and their story is recorded, part of their story is recorded in the book of Matthew chapter 1. And so today we're talking about messy parenting and what we learned from a young couple 2,000 years ago about what it looks like to lead well, to parent well, to come together well uh, in a messy 
season. So before we dive into Scripture, we're going to pause, we're going to have a word of prayer together, um, and just ask God to lead us in our time. <clears throat> Father, we pause, we thank you so much for your son Jesus. God, we ask you to be with us as we, uh, as we just spend a few minutes together in your word. Uh, God, I ask you would speak to each person who's in this room, who's uh, worshiping with us online. Uh, Father, I pray that you be with them, that they would hear your voice, and that they would obey whatever it is you ask them to do today. Uh, Father, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so whether it's in parenting or even if you're not a parent, if you hope to be a parent someday, or you're just kind of walking through life, maybe not even thinking about kids, it doesn't really matter because the principles we talk about today are going to apply to you. So no matter where you're at in the season of life, this is a message you're going to want to hear. The very first thing we learn in Matthew chapter 1 when it comes to this idea is that we need to expect the messy. Starting around verse 18, you just get this concept that like things are not the way they expected them to be whatsoever. Just expect it to be messy. Have you ever noticed how the best parents are people who aren't parents yet? Have you ever noticed that? Like, um, so you're, you're a parent and you're in Target and your kid's throwing a temper tantrum because they can't get something and you're, like, you're the mom carrying your kid out of the store under your arm, you know? And the person who isn't a parent yet is always the one to look at you and judge you and to say things like, I would never do that to my... I will never take my kids to a McDonald's drive through organic, non-GMO only. You know, like the, the people who don't have kids are the ones who are the ones kind of make it, oh, I will be the, I will never give in to the tantrum. I will never raise a Dallas Cowboys fan, you know? And then somehow you end up with a Chad Simpkins and it just gets off the rails and you're like, how did I end up here in this mess with a Cowboys fan? Like when it comes to parenting, you have to expect for things to get messy. Matthew chapter 1, starting verse 18, the birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. Now, in Mary and Joseph's culture especially, this is not a good start to their marriage. It is not a good start to their parenting, even more so than in our own society. Their expectation was that they would go through the engagement, betrothal period of time. They would go through that together. They would be married. Uh, they would move in together at that point, begin living together. But not only, they would not be independent like we think of it. Um, when a couple in our day gets married, they move out and they go and they live an independent life. In Mary and Joseph's culture, what they were most likely going to do was get married and then move back in with mom and dad and the rest of the family, Joseph's family, until they were financially stable, until Joseph had his career underway, until Joseph had financial things in order, plans in order, things in place, and then they would eventually move out and continue their life together. Very different concept from kind of how we approach things today. But before they get anywhere near any of that, before they've said their vows, before they've come together physically, before anything has happened in this entire relationship, Mary becomes pregnant, and it's a complete shock. Like It would have thrown the family, the news would have been bad, people in town would have talked. I mean, it would have just been complete chaos. And at this point, Joseph is well within his rights to divorce her. In fact, there are legal grounds he has at this point to say, I can walk away from this relationship. And oftentimes they would walk away from the relationship in a very public display of, oh, look, this inappropriate thing has happened. I'm out of here disgracing the woman and leaving her kind of to be. Joseph says, I don't want to do that, but I still am thinking it's best to divorce her. I'll just do it quietly and he is well within his rights to do that that is what he planned to do but this scenario the way this is shaping up for them is not what they had planned this is not the dream scenario for mary and joseph growing up in a jewish culture their start was messy and maybe you can relate with that Maybe you haven't had the best relationships. Maybe the current relationship you're in uh, as husband and wife or as a couple is kind of suffering a little bit because of things that happened in past relationships. 
Um, maybe in the messiness, you've had kids in parenting in, over the course of years. Maybe you've had kids walk away from the faith and you've spent years praying that they would come back to, to faith. Maybe you're uh, living in a place of regret because of decisions made that somehow made the mess worse for you. Maybe you're parenting kids who don't respect you and it just makes life difficult. I just want to encourage you. Can I, can I encourage you with something? This is, for what it's worth, this encouragement is easier said than done, but it, it is good encouragement. I want to encourage you parents in the messy situation. I want to encourage you to give thanks. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18, be thankful in all circumstances. Not be thankful when your parenting works out the way you thought it should have worked out. Not only be thankful when your kids are respectful. Be thankful when your kids obey. Be thankful when the college chooses them. Be thankful when your portfolio is good. Be thankful when life is great. Be thankful when you get the promotion. No, no, no. Be thankful in the mess. Be thankful when it's chaotic. Be thankful when you can't get your fingers around it. Be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. As difficult as your mess may be, as chaotic as your situation might be, whatever it is you are currently living through, gratitude will take you far. Practice gratitude. And I say practice because it's a discipline. It's something you have to work on. A lot of, for a lot of us, gratitude and thankfulness don't come naturally. You have to practice and work at it. Why? It is God's will for you who are in Christ Jesus to be grateful in all of your circumstances, no matter how messy it is. If you're here today and you're hopeful to be a parent someday, to be a mom, a dad someday, expect it to be messy you can read all the parenting books you want, and I, I would be willing to put a lot of money down on a bet that says your kid will find a way to write a new chapter in a book you haven't read yet. Like, your kid will be the one, when you think you've got it all down, your kid will be the one that writes this whole other chapter or her whole other chapter where you just go, what is happening? Parents, hopeful parents, expect messy. Expect it to be messy. It's just how it goes. So expect the mess, but amidst the mess, while you're in it, while you're in the chaos, when things aren't going the way you think they should, trust that God has a plan. Watch what happens next for Joseph, verse 20. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. You are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son. They will name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now, like many people in the Bible, uh, people of faith throughout all of Scripture, throughout all of uh, Christian history, Sometimes it's difficult to see the plan that God is developing. Mary and Joseph find themselves in this messy situation because of this pregnancy that kind of pops up out of nowhere in a way that is very difficult to explain because we all know where babies come from. And so it all gets a little bit messy as their entire situation begins to crumble. And as I said, Joseph is planning and well within his legal rights to walk away from the relationship. However, if Mary and Joseph had chosen to view their mess only through human lens, the human perspective, from our angle and vantage point, they would have missed what God was up to in their life. These angels appear and begin to tell them more about what's going on. Mary, okay, now hold on a second, you're not going to believe this, but here comes this baby, and let me tell you, it's going to be a good one. And this angel shows up to Joseph. Listen, Joseph, I know what you got planned. I know what you're thinking about doing, but listen, man, you can't do that. You're going to mess up the plan. You can't go that way. Don't do that. And they hear the message of God. They hear the voice of God, what God expects them to do, the plan that is coming. 
But Mary and Joseph don't have to respond. They have the choice to hear the voice of God, to see the plan that is developing, and choose to either follow in alignment with the plan or to branch off and do whatever it is they would like to do. They listen to what God is up to in their mess, and they begin to discover something. Joseph, specifically in Matthew chapter 1, discovers at least three things about this baby that are just not ordinary at all. Number one, he learns that this baby is from God, conceived by the Holy Spirit. That's a tad out of the ordinary. The, the number two thing, he, he learns that this is all being done to fulfill prophecy. And number three, it is being done so that God can be with His people. Emmanuel, God with us, that God is going to save His people from their sins through this child. Joseph is hearing words from an angel, these commands of God, these plans of God. He is hearing these words that are 700 years old. 700 years before Mary and Joseph are even a thought in their genealogical line. 700 years prior to the birth of Jesus Christ, a prophet by the name of Isaiah says these words, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and they will name him Emmanuel. See, as messy as it was for Mary and Joseph to be parents when they weren't expecting to be uh, parents, even prior to their marriage, prior to having their lives going, God has a plan. And the plan is coming together through the mess and the chaos of Mary and Joseph's situation. Now maybe you've been in a situation like that before. Maybe there was a pregnancy in your life somewhere along the way that was unexpected. It came from a place you weren't quite ready or from someone that you know, like they just weren't quite ready and it just came out of nowhere. If you find yourself there, I hope you will remember a teenage girl by the name of Mary, a soon-to-be husband by the name of Joseph, who were scared and out of sorts, who were in a mess, and yet trusted that God had a plan for their child. God has a plan for your children, parents, and He will accomplish that plan through your faithfulness in stewardship to your children. What does it look like for you, despite the mess, to trust God that He has a plan for your kids and to lead them toward that? What does it look like? It looks like this. Train your children to obey the commands of God. Now, this sounds old school. This, this sounds like an old school idea. Train children to obey commands of God. Like, this reminds me of my roots where I grew up. Like, I grew up in the church Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday night, Wednesday night prayer meetings. Like, I did the whole thing four times a week. It felt like we were at church. Like, it just felt like we lived there. This feels old school. Train them to obey commands of God. Like, and it is old school. It's actually older than Sunday school. It actually goes all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy when God says, you want to know how this is going to work best? It's going to work best this way, parents, if you train your children to obey my commands. Deuteronomy chapter 6, when your son asks you in the future, what is the meaning of the decrees, statutes, and ordinances that the Lord our God has commanded you? When your children, parents, come to you and say, why does it matter? Why does God matter? Who cares? Who cares if we follow God? Who cares if we go to church on Sunday morning? Who cares if we connect with Jesus? Why does it matter? There's a whole bunch of gods, or there are no gods, or it doesn't really matter. Help me understand what's the meaning of all of this. Why? What is the meaning of it all? Tell him. We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand. Let me update that for you in 20. 20. The update for you in 2020 is found in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love that He had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. 
When they wrote it in Deuteronomy, they were slaves to Egypt. They were dead in Egypt. They were slaves there, and God freed them from it. Now we would say, I'm not a slave to Pharaoh. I'm not a slave to Egypt. I am dead, and I am a slave to sin. But through Jesus Christ, God is bringing me back to life. I am made alive again in Christ. Teach your children how much God loves them, that He has a plan for them, that He has a future for them, that He wants them to accomplish things. Tell them more about God's love for them than hours they spend in soccer practice. Give them more hours and time and energy and effort about God's love for them and His plans for them and His purposes for them than time they will spend in AP classes trying to get into that college you really think that they should be getting into. Train your children to obey the commands of God. The plan of God got real messy for Mary and Joseph, not just as newlyweds, not just as parents, but overall, it just got messy. And yet through the mess, God's plan for salvation of mankind was put into place because Mary and Joseph trusted that God had a plan. Expect it to be messy, But in the mess, trust that God has a plan for what's going on. And then the last thing would really just be a practical thing. Like, okay, if I expect the mess and I'm trying to trust that God has a plan, what does it really look like for me practically moving forward to actually walk in that? The answer comes in verses 24 and 25 where we would say be faithful in obedience. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him, and he named him Jesus. This passage here tells us about Joseph's obedience. Um, Other birth narratives of Jesus and other gospels tell of Mary's obedience, and so this isn't an either or. This isn't one parent has to obey or whatever. This is actually both. Mary and Joseph have to obey, but in this particular narrative, Joseph specifically is highlighted, and so God is speaking directly to the dad, at least, in Matthew chapter 1 right here. And so I want to just talk to dads for just a second. Dads, it is really easy for us to abdicate our responsibility to train our children to know the commands of God, to love Him. It is easy for us to abdicate that to the mom. There's nothing wrong with a mother training her children that God loves them. There is something wrong with a dad who won't accept the responsibility to do so. And I say that because the Bible commands fathers to actively engage the training of their children in the instructions of God. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Dads, can I encourage you in the way of Joseph? When you hear the voice of God, when you hear the command and the plan is given to you, and you hear the voice, wake up and do it. Wake up and do something about it. Wake up and walk in faithful obedience. Joseph woke up and he did as the angel commanded. We must walk in faithful obedience. For all believers everywhere, Jesus says it this way, In the book of John, chapter 14 and verse 21, the one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and will reveal myself to him. Have you ever been walking through faith, maybe uh, as a parent or just in general in life, you've been walking through faith, and have you ever had that feeling that you couldn't quite get to Jesus? that there was something in the way, that there was something blocking you, that there was a spiritual blockage that was happening and somehow you couldn't quite get your hands around Jesus. Jesus says here that He will reveal Himself to the ones who are obeying, who are keeping His commands. Mom, Dad, teach your children, train them. Be faithful in obedience. So let me ask you a really simple question with probably a difficult answer, okay? Simple question, difficult answer. 
When was the last time God asked you to do something and you didn't do it? When was the last time it was so clear to you that God was saying, go and do, go do this, be here, step up in this way, and you just flat were like, nope, ain't nobody got time for that. Like, I'm not doing that, I'm not going to obey, I'm not taking the step forward. When was the last time God asked you to do something and you didn't obey? That question assumes a lot about us, doesn't it? It assumes, the question itself assumes of us that we are actually able to hear God's voice in the first place. It assumes that God wants to speak to you as a follower of Jesus, as a disciple of Christ. The question assumes that God is trying to get a message through to you, right? So the question for me then becomes, is it possible to hear the voice of God? Is it possible to hear what God is up to, to hear His plans, and to walk in faithful obedience? Is that possible? Jesus says in John chapter 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. Other translations of that, uh, the word is translated as abide, the one who abides in me, who, who is connected to me on a continual, consistent basis. They are abiding, they are connected. Here he says, the one who remains in me. When you are abiding in Christ, you can hear the voice of God, you can hear the voice of Christ, and you have the choice, just like Mary and Joseph, to be faithful in obedience or to disobey and to do what you would like to do. So the question becomes, what does it look like? How do we abide in Christ in a way that allows us to hear the voice of God to set us up for the option of faithful obedience? What does that look like? Ready for another old school answer? I want to encourage you to a daily commitment of Scripture reading and prayer. I want to challenge you to a daily quiet time where you re-engage your relationship with the Father. Your, your parenting situation is messy. You're not really sure what's going on. The plans are changing. The expectations are all messed up. I don't know if I hear God. I'm not sure if I'm connected to Jesus. I don't really know what to do next. A commitment to re-engage a daily quiet time of Scripture reading and prayer. Would you make a fresh commitment to daily give 5, 10, 15 minutes even to Scripture reading and prayer, to discovering and hearing the voice of God through Scripture reading and prayer, and to do what it is that He asks you to do? I don't know where you're at in that whole conversation, Um, you know, especially as parents like, man, Time to just sit down and be quiet for a minute and have a cup of coffee and read the Bible and pray? Okay, like, there's not a lot of quiet in my house. I don't really know how that works for you guys, but the only time my house is quiet is somewhere between the hours of 4 and 5 a.m. because the Xboxes go until 4 a.m. with online gaming. Like, I mean, where is the time for the quiet? You've got a ton going on. You've got to make the commitment to find the time and prioritize Scripture reading and prayer. Maybe you've started to read the Bible before, but you don't even know what you're reading. You're like, I don't even know what this says. And what is that word? And I need a dictionary to get through this thing. One time you opened the Bible and you started to read like a really good English speaking American. And you started on page one at Genesis one. And Genesis was okay because it's a lot of stories. But then you got to Exodus and it got a little weird. And then you got to Leviticus and you're like, forget this. I have no idea what I'm reading. These laws make no sense. Those people struggled with what? And you're like, I don't want to read the Bible. It just makes no sense. Yada, yada. I don't know where you're at. I don't know where each of you is at on Scripture reading and prayer. Can I encourage you in something that will help you get started? I want to encourage you to read the Gospel of Mark. Here's why. If you read the Gospel of Mark one chapter a day, you'll be done with the Gospel of Mark in less than three weeks. It's that short. Mark's favorite word in his Gospel is the word immediately. Mark is the fastest paced gospel of all of the gospels that we have. In less than three weeks, you can read the entirety of the ministry and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in less than three weeks for about 
two to three minutes a day per chapter as Mark goes through and says, immediately, immediately, immediately. If you struggle with keeping your attention focused on a certain point, you won't have any trouble reading the Gospel of Mark because he moves so quickly as he paces his way through the story of Jesus. You're going to breeze through and you will feel like, I'm on to something. As you're reading the Gospel of Mark, ask yourself these three questions. Number one, what do I learn about God in this chapter? What am I learning about Jesus? What does the text tell me about what God values, who He is, what He's about, what He cares about, what His plans are? Who is God through Scripture? What is it telling me about who God is? Second question, what do I learn about myself? What am I learning about humanity? What do I learn about people? Where do I see the failures of people, the faithfulness of people, or the faithlessness of people? What am I learning about myself? What does the Bible tell me about me as I'm reading through? Third question, final question to ask yourself, what is God asking me to do as a result? What step of obedience do I need to take? Expect life to be messy. Expect parenting to be messy. Expect 2020 to 2021 to not be as clean as maybe you hope it will be to escape 2020. Expect messy. Trust that God has a plan and be faithful in your obedience when He tells you that plan. Let's close with a word of prayer together. Father, we pause and we thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for a time of year when we can celebrate the birth of your son by just talking about Christmas, that we can just give some dedicated time to saying thank you for Jesus. Father, we thank you that even in the mess of what Mary and Joseph faced all around them and the circumstances that were just chaotic all around them, Father, we thank you that you had a plan, that you had a purpose, that you were at work even in the chaos Father, help us to remember that even in our own mess and in our own chaos, that God, you are at work, that you have a plan, that you have a purpose, that you are moving forward in life. Father, help us to sense it, to see it, to hear it. And Father, when you reveal it to us, when you tell us what it is you're up to, when you give us commands, Father, I pray that we would be a people that are faithfully obedient to your word, that we would be like Joseph, Wake up and do what God is asking us to do. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you. You are saving us, redeeming us, reconciling us through him. God, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to take a moment for communion here. So if you're at home, uh, hop off the couch, go grab some juice crackers. If you're here, hopefully you grabbed one of these from the lobby. Uh, You know, all December, all all Christmas season, we talk about the beginning of the story. What I love about this church is every week we take a moment to talk about the climax of the story. Not the end, you know, the climax. Um, This is the whole reason the Christmas story exists, so that we can remember the Easter story. But we remember every week when we take communion. So let's do that together. Um, As we take the bread which represents his body that was broken for us, that was given for us. Let's take and remember him. And then we do the juice, which reminds us of his blood, which was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's take this and remember. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for what this symbolizes, what this is meant to remind us. Thank you that we take this moment to remember every week, not just at Easter. Help us to think about it every day, to remember what you've done for us, the whole reason you came to earth. The whole story hinges around this moment. All of creation, all of our existence was when God came to earth to be the sacrifice to rescue us so that we can be with him, God with us again. Thank you, Lord. Let us never put this aside or forget it and let it go to the back of our mind. Help us to dwell on this and internalize this this week. 
Thank you for the mess and how you love us through it and you use us in spite of it. Um, we love you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's worship together one more time. Amen. What do you say we finish today by doing exactly what the man suggested? Let's rejoice. Stand to your feet if you're here. Let's bless the Lord together today. Come and bless. Come bless the Lord. Come bless the Lord. Draw near to worship Christ the Lord. And bless his name, his holy name. Declaring his good. Oh, that we would praise him. Oh, that we would praise him. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, again I say, rejoice. From the top, come bless. Come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, draw near to worship Christ the Lord, and bless his name, his holy name, declaring he is good. Oh, that we would praise him, oh, that we would praise him, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord. And again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, again I say, rejoice. Yeah, yeah. And we can rejoice in the fact that the God of the universe calls us his friends. You are God Almighty, Lord of glory. You have called me friend. Just sing that today. God Almighty, Lord of glory. You have called me friend. It's amazing. You are the God Almighty, Lord of glory, and you have called me friend. Let's go one more time. Sing God Almighty, Lord of glory, and you have called me friend. So let's rejoice in it. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, again I say, rejoice. Let's rejoice, 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 rejoice. Never forget that the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. What wonderful news that the God of the universe wants to be our friends. Let's go out and let that encourage us this holiday season and every other season too. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us today, and we will see you guys right back here next week. Stay cool, stay blessed, stay in touch. <laughs>